the resurrection is one of the most misunderstood doctrines that we've got to agree about. There is actual disagreement about the fact as well as disagreement about the meaning. The disagreement about the fact as to whether Jesus rose or didn't rise from the dead comes from outside and inside Christianity. So the Muslims, of course, to some extent disagree that Jesus died, so they're not really into him rising from the dead. But you can find many books on the subject that argue about the facts. One of the ones that I've used is by Pincus Lapide, written there on your notes, although there's an E to the end of his name, called The Resurrection of Jesus, published by Augsburg uh, in the late 1980s, something like that. I use it because he was Jewish. He lived and died a Jewish man. He died around the beginning of this century. Uh, he was a New Testament scholar, or, or first century Jewish, uh, was he, first century Judaism was his interest. He was a diplomat from the state of Israel. He lived and died. But he argued about the facticity of the resurrection and argued for the resurrection of Jesus. He then, of course, had to find a new interpretation of it other than Jesus was the Messiah. But he said the evidences were historically overwhelming in favour of it. From a Christian point of view, this is where N.T. Wright is so helpful for us. He wrote a very big fat book on the resurrection, which really is very strong at the level of the historicity of the resurrection and answering those who would want to be uh, theologically liberal, but still believe in the resurrection, but change the meaning of the word resurrection so that it kind of, uh, you see, if you say, I don't believe in the resurrection, you're a heretic. So they say, no, I do believe in the word. I do believe in the resurrection. It's just... It's a myth, but I believe in it. I believe in the myth, you see. So you can't say I don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. I can still say the creed. I just don't uh, actually think that the tomb was empty. Um, well, Tom Wright takes you through the whole arguments and shows what the New Testament uh, teaches uh, very clearly. Uh, there are any other books, though, on the evidences for the resurrection, you know, from the Josh McDowell kind of ones to Professor J.N.D. Anderson, Michael Green. It just goes on and on, the number of Christian evidentialists who have argued for the resurrection. But therein lies something of the problem, because there's a lot of disagreement about the meaning of the resurrection. So N.T. Wright's book on the resurrection, big and fat and covering everything, I think doesn't understand the meaning of the resurrection at all. Um, the historicity he's good on, the meaning of it, well, that's a different thing because there's terrific disagreement. And what I find and we found in teaching Two Ways to Live is that Christians have more difficulty understanding the meaning of the resurrection than non-Christians, uh, which is very sad. Uh, we find it quite difficult. In part, it's got to do with our anti-adoptionism. Adoptionism is the great heresy of the early church that Jesus was adopted uh, the man was adopted into divinity, which is a great heresy, which we must oppose. But there are those passages of the scriptures that the adoptionist used, which still seem an embarrassment to Orthodox Christians because they haven't understood the phrase son of God. They think that means God the son. And they haven't understood that the resurrection has changed things dramatically. So Acts chapter 2 verse 36 that the God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. It's in the resurrection that Jesus is made the Lord and the Christ. Or Romans 1, 4, he's been declared as son of God in power through his resurrection. Or in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, he, the mind of Christ, he became obedient even unto death. Therefore... God has raised him up to sit at the right hand and every knee shall bow. That actually out of his crucifixion, the payment for the sins of the world, came his elevation to a new position of power and authority that he did not have beforehand. Now, because of our belief in God the Son, we believe he has always been in charge, ruling the world as the second member of the Trinity. But, in fact, he now as the human resurrected from the dead rules the world in a way that prior to his incarnation, he did not as a man rule the world because he wasn't a man prior to that. So in our anti-adoptionism, we're uncomfortable to read the meaning and significance of the resurrection. In addition, because we are cross people and we should be the cross people because we believe in the atonement, the centrality of the atonement. When Jesus called out, it is finished, 
we think it is all finished. And so the resurrection becomes an afterthought in our gospel presentations. Uh, it's a little bit kind of tacked on the end. Well, because it was finished, then that happened as well. He didn't stay dead. He rose. And so we're a bit blind to what the scriptures actually teach. We skip over things and don't notice. Let me try and see. Here is a verse, Acts 4, 1 and 2. Don't want you to look it up. I want you to look at the text on the thing because I've actually left two words out. Now, I want you to work out what the two words are that I've left out. You see, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus' resurrection from the dead. I've left two words out. Do you want to just, I see, I'm, uh, as soon as we get one person to nominate what the two are, you'll all say, oh yeah, well I can see that. I want you to actually identify the two words before we get the answer uh, to what it is. So when you've worked out two words that you think that are left out anywhere, does anybody not see where the two words are? Anyone see where the two words are, they think? Those who've got confidence, right? Now, there is a hint for those who are honest enough to say they don't know. Here is a little hint. There's a grammatical problem. It's a spelling problem, actually. There's a grammatical problem to read it the way it is at the moment, isn't there? Now, those of you who think we've, that you know where the two words that are left out once I've said that, you'll say, ah, yes, I was right. Is that correct? You can see it. It's a spelling problem, as it is at the moment. It's spelling incorrectly. How can you just leave a word out, make the spelling wrong, and the words that are left in? Well, it's a punctuation problem. Does that help you more? Okay, who can tell me what the two words are that are left out? In and the, they're the two words that are left out. Yes, quite so. Proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. But you see, as it was, you didn't notice the problem. Now, what difference does it make? Huge amount. <laughs> Huge amount. He, they weren't talking about Jesus' resurrection, which would have then had an apostrophe S somewhere. Uh, they were talking about the resurrection. But the resurrection comes about in Jesus. So what is the resurrection that comes about in Jesus? Because it's more than just Jesus' resurrection. See, the resurrection is the central doctrine uh, of, of the New Testament. In the book of Acts, when they're preaching the gospel, they always mention the resurrection. It is the one subject that is mentioned in every evangelistic address in the book of Acts. And yet we know that Paul writing about the gospel in 1 Corinthians 1 says we preach the cross and in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 we preach of first importance that Jesus died for our sins and then he goes on to speak about the resurrection and that's because there is a certain artificiality of separating the cross and the resurrection he can't rise from the dead without dying right so you the resurrection will always involve the death and it is true the victory was won at the cross that the resurrection is the finality of. It's like saying, you know, we conquered Germany without D-Day. No, the victory was won on D-Day. It was won actually on the invasion into Europe. It took another several months before we actually finally defeated Hitler and the forces. But he was a beaten man once he couldn't stop the invasion that landed on the European shores. The great deciding battle was there on the shores it was still had to be implemented. Well, the great deciding battle was when Jesus turned aside the wrath of God on the cross. But by winning that, the whole new world opened up in the resurrection. And the resurrection is critical for all of it. Now, for many Christians, the resurrection is just evidentialist apologetics. We want to prove the existence of God or the existence of the supernatural or that Jesus is God or something like that. And so we show the evidences for the resurrection. This has been a, uh, a method of argument for many, many years, and there's many books that do it. Uh, Who Moved the Sown by uh, Frank Morrison. Um, 
Uh, Michael Green wrote a book on the resurrection. Uh, it's the Josh McDowell kind of line. However, it, it has really got some very significant problems. Uh, it's not really the way the New Testament argues, although I'll show you some evidences otherwise. The New Testament is all about the theological implications of the resurrection. And that's the failure of the N.T. Wright book on the resurrection. It's not about the theological implications, it's about the historical evidences. Now, there's a place for it, and it's a good book for that end. But it should be on the historical evidences for the resurrection, not the resurrection as such. And the evidentialist apologetics always runs into problems. So a dear friend of mine sat up to Louise Morlaus arguing with a Hindu friend in a, a university college about the resurrection, finally persuaded the man that that's we small hours, he said, I agree, then Jesus rose from the dead. To which my friend said, then you'll become a Christian. To which the Hindu said, no, there's quite a few Hindu gurus that have risen from the dead also. This doesn't prove that Jesus is God or that I should become a Christian. It's the whole evening wasted, you see, because you've got to actually have a framework, a context into which to place that argument. And you've got to remember the warning of Jesus. In Luke 16, verse 31, Jesus has just told the parable of the rich man and the poor man. And at the end of it, in verse 31, he says, if they will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe if someone rises from the dead. So to argue with people who don't believe Moses and the prophets that Jesus has risen from the dead is not actually going to work. And you might say, well, it worked with me. And I said, well, that's great. That's fantastic. And there's every chance that you knew about Moses and the prophets beforehand, or you might be just slow. But it doesn't in itself work. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 19, uh, it does speak to us about the implications of the resurrection, which shows you the very centrality of the resurrection. So I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has been, not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he didn't raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That is, the resurrection of Christ comes in the context of a belief in the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then Christ hasn't risen. But the important thing about Christ rising is not demonstrating there is a resurrection, it's demonstrating that our sins have been forgiven. For if Christ hasn't risen from the dead, we are still in our sins, misrepresenting God by our gospel preaching and most to be pitied amongst those people because we've got our hope in something that is not real. Now, the New Testament does use the evidences of the resurrection. Don't, don't, uh, let's not overstate the case of presuppositionalism against evidentialism. For example, in Acts chapter 26, Paul is giving his defence before Agrippa and he says, uh, in, uh, Festus has just said, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Then verse 25, Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words for the king, that's Agrippa, knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this hasn't been done in a corner. So the resurrection of Jesus, which he's been arguing for, is something public knowledge. You can test it out. You can go and look. But notice the next verse, verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know that you believe. Because if you don't believe in Moses and the prophets, you won't believe if someone rises from the dead. So the resurrection fact and facticity needs to be placed in the context of the resurrection of the prophets of the Old Testament. Because if you haven't got that context, even if you go with Pincus Lapid and agree that it happened, you won't understand what it means. Because the New Testament is about what it means much more than about the facticity of it actually happening. Because the gospel 
is about the resurrection. So if you look just over a few pages in Romans 1, where he talks about the gospel of God in verse 1, it says, which he promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. See, the prophets and the apostles, Moses, you've got to know them before you can know what that's about. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. If you don't know about the prophets and about David, what does it matter that he's descended from David according to the flesh? But that is critical. And was declared to be son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gospel of God. It's about his being descended from David and therefore the Messiah being risen from the dead and pouring out the spirit and therefore the Messiah. Because if you remember the end of Acts chapter 2 with the pouring out of the spirit, he says that it is the risen Christ who can do this. And that's how we know that God has made him both Christ and Lord, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's by his resurrection and the outpouring of the spirit. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8, Paul then describes his gospel. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, the gospel for which he's in chains. And he says, I desire that in every... No, 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 no. It's 2 Timothy, isn't it? 2 Timothy 2, 8, sorry. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. So what are the two elements of the gospel? Descended from David, risen from the dead. Because both of those point to Jesus is Christ. That's what Paul was preaching. And that is... So central doctrine of the Bible is the resurrection. Central doctrine of the gospel is the resurrection. Yet for many gospel preaching evangelicals and evangelists, the resurrection is the afterthought, is the kind of denouement to the story, right? That it just, you know, the great crisis has happened. He calls out it is finished. And um, oh, by the way, he didn't remain dead. He rose from the dead. Or they use it as here is the argument that proves the story is correct. When, in fact, Jesus says people won't believe unless. So the essential background that we need is that it was preached to us uh, according to the scriptures. Point A, 3A. Now you see that in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, when Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples, having risen from the dead, having demonstrated that he's not a ghost by eating flesh with them. He then opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and die and rise again on the third day, uh, uh, rise from the dead. The little word must, day in Greek, is very important here. It was what was said. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, not only is it that he died, but that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. He dies according to the scriptures. He rises according to the scriptures. And so in Acts 17, Acts 17, we see Paul in the uh, Thessalonican um, uh, synagogue arguing with them. And what is the nature of his argument in Acts 17? And Paul went in, as was his custom, on three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. See, when you understand the scriptures, you will know that the Christ has to suffer and rise. Now, who suffered and risen? Well, there's only one man who suffered and risen from the dead, Jesus. He fits the bill for the expectation of scriptures. But without that understanding the expectation of scriptures, you mightn't understand what Jesus rising from the dead means. It's in that context you understand. It's where Mr. Lapid doesn't understand. He doesn't take on board what the scriptures are teaching about the Messiah. He just takes on board Jesus rose from the dead. But it didn't prove he's the Messiah. Which scriptures are we talking about here? Point B. Well, Daniel chapter 12 speaks of it. One of the key passages is Ezekiel 36, 37, which speaks of the coming of the kingdom and the coming of the king. And in that, if you remember, the first half of 37 is the valley of dry bones, where the prophet prophesies to the valley of dry bones, breathes the spirit of God into the valley of dry bones, and the whole nation comes in the general resurrection. 
And so we are looking forward to the coming of the King, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Son of David, when the Spirit of God is going to be poured into the hearts of all the people and moved to keep the, 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 the law of God. Of course, the nation is going to be regenerated. It's going to be reborn. It's going to be resurrected on that day. And so the, the Messianic kingdom is a kingdom of the resurrection, according to Ezekiel 36 and 37. I think, by the way, that every phrase in the Lord's Prayer can be found in Ezekiel 36, 37. I think they're two of the most important chapters of the Old Testament to an understanding of the mind of Jesus. But Psalm 16, God will not let the Holy One see corruption. Or Psalm 49 verse 12 has me completely forgotten what that one is now. I know that's the great one about ransoming my life from death. Is that what is being said in Psalm 49 verse 12? I cannot remember why I have Psalm 49 verse 12. Man in his pomp will not perish, remain. He's like the beasts that perish. I think Psalm 49 verse 12 is wrong. Psalm 2 is of course the great Psalm of the Messiah, Psalm 110, Hosea 6, 1 to 2. I've picked them all except for Psalm 49, 12 because the New Testament uses them. You see, the New Testament already has the debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are already in disagreement over this. You remember in Acts 23, when Paul is being dragged in front of the council in Jerusalem, he perceives that there are Pharisees and Sadducees in the room. And so he says, I believe in the resurrection. I'm a Pharisee because I believe in the resurrection. And the, the whole group is then divided because the Pharisees then start defending him. We don't like to think of a Christian as a Pharisee. Uh, Pharisees always mean negative bad things, don't they? Hypocrites, etc. But when needed, you can call yourself a Pharisee because on the issue of resurrection, Christians are on the Pharisee side of the question, not on the Sadducee side because they didn't believe in the prophets. They didn't believe in angels, spirits. They didn't believe in the other world. They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, which explains why they asked Jesus you know, about the, the trick question they have, the woman who couldn't cook uh, properly and who saw seven husbands die off. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Because all of them had her as their wife. To which Jesus then replies, the resurrection is different to this world because in the resurrection we won't die and therefore in the resurrection we won't marry because being married is about having children. And so you don't need to marry in the resurrection. It's a different world order. That is, there's a big disjunction between this world and the next world, just as there is a big conjunction between this world and the next world. And one of the great confusions among Christians today is which is disjunction and which is conjunction. But the whole argument with them in Luke 20, verses 27 to 38, Mark 12, 18 to 27, is this argument about the nature of it. Now in that, Jesus uses Exodus 3, 6 to be able to show that the resurrection is taught not just in the prophets, but in the great prophet Moses himself, because the voice came at the bush, at the issue of the bush, if you remember, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac. God is not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. And so the fact he talks about being still the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob shows that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob still live beyond the grave. So the grave is not the end. It's not an argument that has great appeal to the modern mind of thinking, but it is an argument that it shows the nature of uh, biblical understanding of life after death and the expectation of Moses. That is, the essential background is the resurrection. I thought you, when you wrote that heading in, you mightn't put the the in enough bold, italic importance. So I put it in there for you so as to make sure that you will get the point that this is really the critical issue that people don't understand. The Old Testament background to it is classically Ezekiel 36, 37. That's as good two chapters as to study on the whole subject. But there is an expectation in the New Testament that there will be the resurrection. So, for example, in Luke 14, 14, it's just a passing reference, but the fact that it is a passing reference shows how profoundly accepting of, of the idea of the resurrection Jesus has. So Luke 14, 14, uh, 
he said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours, lest they invite you to return uh, and you be repaid. Verse 13, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. It's a way of talking about heaven. It's a way of talking about the next world. It's a way of talking about the judgment day. The resurrection is going to be the time at which you will be rewarded. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection, then how can Jesus be raised? The resurrection lies as the background to Jesus' resurrection in the argument of 1 Corinthians 15. Acts 4.2, as I showed you previously, it's in the resurrection. They were preaching, and the Sadducees were upset because they were preaching in Jesus, the resurrection. They weren't preaching Jesus' resurrection. They were preaching the general resurrection has commenced because Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus himself teaches in, say, John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. The, the teaching of the New Testament, which the, Pharise the Old Testament, which the Pharisees had understood rightly because they believed in the prophets, was that there was going to be a general resurrection. It's in that context that Jesus rises from the dead. It's in that context that Jesus predicts his own resurrection. You, you see it in John 11, John 11, where Lazarus dies. A little while I'll tell you Lazarus wasn't resurrected, he was resuscitated, but never mind, he dies, right? Uh, two of my favourite childhood verses were found in this passage. One, the shortest verse in the Bible, which was always my chosen memory verse, uh, <laughs> Jesus wept. Ah, I could always pass that test. And the other one was, you only get it in the King James Version, Lord, he stinketh. Uh, as a little boy, that is a wonderful verse. It goes along with superfluity of naughtiness and some other things that we have there that only the King James had. Now, you get Martha, you see, contesting with Jesus in, in chapter 25, verse 21 onwards, where Martha said, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus said he will rise from the dead. Now, you and I know what that means. That means he's going to come out of the grave. What does Martha say? Yes, I know he'll rise from the dead at the resurrection. Right? Because the resurrection is the thing that Ezekiel was talking about, that Jesus was talking about, the resurrection of the just. And, the, and Lazarus was one of God's people. He'll rise at the resurrection. <coughs> In common Australian parlance, she heard him say, he'll go to heaven. Right? And yeah, of course he'll go to heaven. I know that. But the common parlance of go to heaven is not the Bible's parlance. The Bible way of saying it is, he'll rise for the resurrection of the just. He will be on God's side in the resurrection. And so then Jesus says, I am the resurrection. That's a weird thing to say. But see, he is the one who in Jesus is the resurrection. That's what Acts chapter 4 verse 2 is saying, which we didn't recognise it as many of us didn't recognise it as being odd that a couple of words were left out because we don't think in terms of the resurrection of which Jesus commences and participates. We don't think of the judgment as equal to the resurrection. So in the NT Wright book, judgment is not part of the resurrection. There's a big fat six, seven hundred page book on the resurrection without mentioning the judgment. But then that's what it's about. It's about the judgment day. And he will rise in the resurrection. But Jesus is that judgment day. He is the one who brings it. And so in, in John chapter 20, verse 9, John chapter 20, verse 9, we, we say, uh, Then the other disciple who reached the term first went in and saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. The resurrection was what is required and expected of anybody who is truly to be the Messiah. That is 
part of the deal. Now, have you ever pondered why it was that Peter and the other disciples did not understand Jesus when he predicted his resurrection? You see, you are the Christ. Then he acknowledges that and says, now the son of man must suffer, be abused, be killed, and on the third day rise again. Hallelujah, this is wonderful. No, they heard he must suffer and die and then go to heaven. Go to the judgment day. Be like, so they were just like, they were just like Martha. To say he will rise again on the third day is not that he's going to come out of the tomb three days later. To rise on the third day is he will be righteous in the judgment day. They hadn't connected yet that in Jesus the resurrection was commencing. So they didn't hear what he was saying, even though he said it repeatedly to them. It wasn't until after he rose from the dead that they remembered that he'd, he'd told them he was going to do that because it just didn't make sense to them. You see it in the, in the upper room dialogue of uh, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, where again, he talks about going away and coming again and they just don't get it. Uh, you see it repeatedly. See, the resurrection and the Messiah and the Spirit all go together. Proving that Christ must suffer and rise from the dead leads you to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ. And so Acts 17, 2 and 3 in Thessalonica, in Thessalonica, when he argues in the synagogue, he proves that Christ must suffer and rise. And the one who suffered and rise is Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is the Christ. The Old Testament background to that is this Ezekiel 36, 37. But the argument, well, in Acts chapter 2, he argues from Joel 2, if you remember, go to Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, and the Spirit has come, and they say, what is this about? You're drunk? No, no, it's too early in the day. We're not Australians. And so, <laughs> verse 16, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour my Spirit out on all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, young men, etc. And then I will show wonders, 19, in the heavens above, the earth, signs of the earth below, blood and fire, vapour of smoke, the sun turned to darkness, the moon to blood. None of that was happening. But this is the end of the world. This is the judgment day that is happening. Because when the Spirit comes, that is the Ezekiel 36 time and 37 time, which brings the resurrection. And so he goes on to argue that from uh, Luke chapter 16, uh, sorry, from Psalm 16, that David, he knew about it, but because David said that verse 27 of Acts 2, the Lord will not abandon my soul to Hades or let his holy one see corruption. And he says, well, David wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about his son, the Messiah. We know that because David did see corruption. His tomb's just around the corner up the road there. You can still see, dig him out. He's corrupt now, a thousand years later. So we know that that's not David. David was talking about the one who was going to rise from the dead. And so, verse 33, being therefore, no, verse 32, this Jesus God raised up, and of all we are witnesses, therefore, uh, being exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David didn't ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, then quote Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until your enemies are your footstool. Let all house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The day of Pentecost is about the coronation of Jesus is about the demonstration that Jesus is now the Christ, the Messiah, because he has risen from the dead and poured out the Spirit. It's not about speaking in tongues. It's ultimately not about the Spirit. It's about Christ. Now you see this in Acts 13, Acts 13, to which you may not be as familiar. Verse 30 to 38 is a long uh, speech there. Paul and uh, Barnabas are at Antioch in Pisidia giving their speech. And as you get to the climax of it in, say, uh, where am I picking it up from? Verse 30, am I? Um, but God raised him from the dead. For many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that 
what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. There's Psalm 16 again. For that, that David, after he had served the purposes of God of his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything for which you could not be freed for by the law of Moses." You see, the same pattern of argument is used. Isaiah 55 is included there in verse 34, but Psalm 2, Psalm 16, the same concept is given. To be the son of David, you have to live forever. David didn't live forever, but one risen from the dead does live forever. And so the gospel of Romans 1, 1 to 4, the gospel of God, is about Jesus is declared son of God in power, by his resurrection. The gospel of Paul is descended from David, risen from the dead. That's the gospel. It's not the way we preach the gospel, but it is the gospel. When we put the resurrection on the back burner kind of denouement of the gospel, we are really shifting the emphasis quite a long way away from where the New Testament has it. The gospel is the declaration that Jesus is now King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of rulers. He's got there by his atoning sacrifice. So you can't leave the atoning sacrifice out because that's how he got there. But the gospel is the world is now different. Jesus is now king. Jesus is now Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is Lord. That's the gospel. And therefore the resurrection is an essential part of this gospel message. Now, when you look then at the events, I'm not going to rehearse them. You know them and you'll hear them this weekend. But Jesus predicted, but they didn't understand. So you see there in Mark 8, 31, 9, 9 to 10, 9, 31, 10, 30. They don't understand. I mean, as he's coming down from the transfiguration, they were, they, they were saying, what does it mean rising from the dead? because they couldn't understand why he was talking about his resurrection from the dead because they were thinking eschatologically all the time, the judgment day. They didn't understand the judgment day was going to commence with him rising from the dead. And so he has to explain it to them in Luke 24, 46. The physical resurrection was, of course, witnessed by them in many places, in many ways, repeatedly you find that they're resurrected. I, following uh, from my own son's instruction of me, have learnt that 1 John 1, 1 to 4 is a description of the physical resurrection, that which we've touched, that which we've seen, that which we've handled. That is the word of life, is a way of talking about the resurrected body. It's not talking about the incarnation, it's talking about the resurrection of the incarnate Jesus. Uh, in 1 John 1 to 4, because it's using the same language at the end of Luke's gospel and the end of John's gospel about the resurrection body. The physical, he, he appeared and demonstrated himself, Acts 1 verse 3, many times to his disciples. And 1 Corinthians 15 actually lists out the many times he appeared and the other time 500 on one occasion. But there's also built into it is the ascension and heavenly session. That is, Jesus didn't rise to come out from the grave and hang around with us now. He rose to ascend to the right hand of his father in heaven. And so Acts 1, 9 to 11 shows the son of man rising there. This is the problem, of course, with the 1 Peter 3 passage. He was put to death in the flesh and raised in the spirit. That is not to say that he is only a spiritual body, not a physical body. He is physically risen from the dead, but he's put to death in this world, the flesh, to be raised in the next age, the age of the spirit, physically, where he is at the right hand of God in all power and authority as the son of man. For that is where the son of man was to come in all power and authority. There's no mention of the resurrection in Hebrews, uh, but all through Hebrews is the ascension. The, because 
The resurrection and the ascension go together. He rose to sit at God's right hand. Now, Hebrews also, he rose as the great high priest entering into the tabernacle, presenting the blood of the sacrifice that was his own blood. And so Hebrews is very strong on the uh, ascension, which really is the resurrection. But the kingdom of Christ and of God, which is talked of in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, 28, is an important element here. That at the moment, Christ is king and all authorities are being placed under his feet as his angels are going out to gather in the nations underneath him. But when all is finally gathered under him, then he presents the kingdom to his father so that God will be all in all. We are living now in the kingdom of Christ as king. He is now the king of kings and lord of lords. But also built into the resurrection is the concept of his return. So Hebrews 9, 27 is appointed to die once and after that judgment because Jesus returned not to uh, uh, deal with sins. He's done that already. And so, or 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we await the Son from heaven who will rescue us from the wrath to come, whom God has raised from the dead. Or again, uh, you get it in chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. We will rise from the dead because he has risen from the dead. And so it goes on, we will be transformed into his glorious body, our vile bodies as the King James Version had us in Philippians 3.20, will be transformed into his glorious body. So our present resurrection, you see, comes from the outpouring of the Spirit from the risen Lord Jesus. The verses that are there for you. For he was not just rising from the dead, he was the first fruits of the resurrection. It wasn't just a, an individual thing. Jesus rose from the dead. No, no. Jesus rising from the dead commences the resurrection. You might remember that very strange little expression in uh, Matthew 27, where it talks about the saints of old coming out from the tombs. And it sounds like at the time of Jesus' death, but actually it says, and appearing to many after the resurrection of Jesus. They didn't, although it's there in the middle of the death description, it actually says explicitly that after the resurrection, because Jesus is the first of the resurrection and the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the resurrection who commences the judgment. But by the pouring out of his spirit, the spirit of the risen Lord Jesus, we come to regeneration. So in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we are dead in our sins and trespasses, but God in his grace raised us up with Christ to sit with him in the heavenly realms. Or in Colossians chapter 3, if you've risen with Christ, then put to death the things that are of this earth and uh, set your mind on the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God because you are in Christ. You are hidden in Christ. When Christ who us appears, we too will appear with him in glory. So our present resurrection, which speaks of our future resurrection, comes out of Jesus' resurrection. We're born again because Jesus has risen from the dead and poured out his spirit of regeneration so that it would bring us to new life. Our resurrection comes from his resurrection. All this then leads to all kinds of meanings and alternatives. No, I don't want to go there yet, do I? Firstly, the significance. If the dead are not raised, then let's eat, drink, and for tomorrow we die. There's the first one of the significance. See, the resurrection changes everything in life. Now, in the Q&A show of some time ago, I think it was 2014, it was during the Festival of Dangerous Ideas and someone asked the question, which dangerous idea has the greatest potential to change the world for the better? The first answer came from Dan Savage. Can I go back to the previous one? Dan Savage is this man over on the uh, extreme left, over my side, who is a homosexual uh, leader and advocate. Uh, Jermaine Greer is right over there on the right side and Peter Hitchens is there with his mouth open with uh, gesticulating uh, the Jewish lady. I won't refer to her because her answer was not worth referring to. Dan Savage, his answer to the question, what is the greatest, uh, most dangerous idea that has potential for change in the world for better? Abortion should be mandatory for 30 years. 
That is a wonderful idea, isn't it? Remember, that's what he said. Jermaine Greer, she answered then as well. Her answer, freedom. Jermaine Greer, you see, is not a, an egalitarian feminist. She's a women's liber. She believes in liberation, not in equality. Uh, she's, she's quite unhappy with modern feminists and the way they've taken the movement away from the key fundamental, namely liberty. But the answer that stopped the show was Peter Hitchens. Now, he's a journalist. He's the brother of the atheist Christopher Hitchens. He was raised atheistically, was a very keen atheist, uh, and got converted, strangely, by looking at a triptych in Europe which showed the scenes of hell and the fact that everybody went naked. Um, uh, it had a profound effect upon him because he realised that all the pretense, all the things that you show and cover up your body is of any relevance when you're in the facement of judgement, that you go naked to judgement and you are what you are and it had a great effect upon him. Anyway, uh, Peter Hitchens on this occasion, which is the dangerous idea, has the greatest potential to change the world for the better? He said, the most dangerous idea in human history and philosophy remains the belief that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and rose from the dead. And that's the most dangerous idea you'll ever encounter. Well, Tony Jones could not believe this. Uh, he went on and then he came back because, you know, the other person answered. And he said, but, but let, just, just explain to me. He said, just quickly, because I think you can't really leave it there. Why is that dangerous? You see, this is totally so conservative as to be of no danger at all. So Hitchens got another chance to explain. Because it alters the whole of human behaviour and all our responsibilities. It turns the universe from a meaningless chaos into a designed place in which there is justice and there is hope. And therefore we all have a duty to discover the nature of that justice and work towards that hope. It alters us all. If we reject it, it alters us as well. It is incredibly dangerous. It's why so many people turn against it. See, he has understood. The gospel is the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who's died for our sins, turning aside the wrath of God. Do not, do not hear me saying the gospel is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and assume that I do not believe in penal substitutionary atonement. It's just that the confrontation where the rubber hits the road is Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. We now live anno domini. We now live in the year of the Lord. And so he's right. He's right both in its importance and also in the consequence of rejecting it. Here's Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist atheist. All existing being beings, all existing beings are born for no reason, continue through weakness and die by accident. Man is a useless passion. It's meaningless that we're born. It's meaningless that we die. So there's no resurrection. There's no resurrection. There's no meaning. Just as when there's no creation, there's no meaning. When there's no resurrection, there's no meaning. But Professor Alex Rosenberg is the professor of philosophy at Duke University, one of the great big universities of America. He wrote a book called uh, The Atheist's Guide uh, to Reality, Enjoying Life Without Illusions. Here are a series of questions he puts. I'm just quoting the book. What is the meaning of life? There is none. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before, except us. And so what is the meanings and values in life? It goes on, is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid or anything else you don't like forbidden, permissible or sometimes obligatory? Anything goes. There is classic atheism. We've got to expose it for what it is, friends. It's not humanistic morality. That's not what it is. That's what it is. That's the logic of the philosopher who's an atheist. And without the resurrection, anything goes. Now, in the ancient world, Paul argued with the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Epicureans were the atheists of the day. And he argued with them in Athens about the resurrection. Notice how they got confused. They thought he was preaching two gods, Jesus and the resurrection. Which again, you see, it wasn't they were heard him preaching the resurrection of Jesus. They heard him preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And you'll notice at the end when he's on the Areopagus, he sees Jesus' resurrection as the evidence of 
the resurrection. God has appointed the resurrection and shown it to you by raising a man from the dead. And so the Epicurus, if you don't know much about him, Epicurus said, death is nothing to us. Uh, one of the epigraphs of Epicureans was, I was not, I was, I am not, I don't care. And it said in the garden gateway over their house was the inscription, Stranger, here you would do well to tarry. Here our highest good is pleasure. But of course, for Epicurean, determining what pleasure is and what pleasure isn't was a very painful experience. So in the end, he said, the magnitude of pleasures reaches its limit in the removal of all pain. He couldn't find what actually gave pleasure. He just wanted to remove pain. And so ultimately for Epicureanism, your aim is ataraxia. Terasso uh, means uh, trouble, stirring of things. Atarasso means calm. That, that's all he wanted. So the calm on the water before it's bubbling up. You see, boiling water is terasso. Still water, atarasso. That's what life is. Just chill, just cool, just calm. That's the ultimate good, the nothingness of life. What are the alternatives then, you see? Well, the alternative 1 Corinthians 15. Let's eat, drink and be merry. What well, doesn't say be merry for tomorrow we die. The annihilation. Whoa, am I giving you headings here? Yes. Uh, no, I'm not. No, we go back. You've got them already, haven't you? Uh, annihilation is one, uh, which can't be because Hebrews 9.27. Uh, resuscitation. No. Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, the widow of Zarephath's son, they all died again. The resurrection is to not just re be res resuscitated, it is that, but it's more than that. It's to be resuscitated in order never to die again, as is said of Jesus. Uh, the immortality of the soul? No, it's the resurrection of the body. The immortality of the soul has no sense of personal identity. Your soul gets linked in with all the other world soul. And so you, and then reincarnation, you see, you get dropped back into a different body. But no, our lowly bodies will be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body in Philippians 3, 20, 21. And a spiritual resurrection, well, that's the problem of the 1 Peter 3, 18 verse, that it can be understood that. But 1 Corinthians 15, with what kind of body shall they return? And the spiritual body is clearly a physical one in that passage, but it will be a body appropriate for the new world. Here is a problem for those who want to see too much continuation between this world and the next world. It is you, it is you bodily, but it is you so transformed that we will think you're good looking. You know, you don't ask which age am I going to be because you'll be ageless. Because there's no marriage, because there's no death. You see, you and I are only used to dying bodies. Because once we were born, we've been dying. Some of us earlier than others are more manifestly dying than others. But we're all dying. Whereas in the new body, we will not be dying. So there'll be some significant differences in our bodies, but it will still be us. So the resurrection, chapter, John chapter 5, verse 28, you've got to think of the judgment day. Everybody rises, not simply Jesus. You've got to think in chapter 11, verse 21, that Jesus is the resurrection, not Lazarus. And you've got to think in Romans 8, 18 to 25, that the glory of the future is so far exceeding the suffering that the suffering of now is not worth considering. Because we've already received the spirit of his son so that we've been born again. But the glory that the sons are going to receive is, comes with the redemption of our bodies. And so the whole world is waiting for that day, for our resurrection physically that we've already had spiritually. And the, uh, there is a conjunction and a disjunction, just like between the Old and New Testament. Some things are continue on the same. Other things are finished and abolished and done away with. So in this age and the age to come, some things continue. You are you. But some things are going to be radically different. You are going to be glorious, which frankly, looking at you, you're not yet. So what is the meaning of the resurrection? And here I've got how many numbers you've got there. 11, is it? Here we go. Jesus conquers death. Acts 2, 24. 
You've got the verses there, haven't you? Secondly, death doesn't have the last word, which is pretty important. Thirdly, life is not meaningless because we are to live for the next world, not for this world. Classic one in chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 of 2 Corinthians, isn't it? That we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised again. We're now living for the other world, not for this. For me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Either way, I'm living for the world to come, not for this world. Resurrection changes everything like that. Four, there's personal identity is real and continues beyond the grave. But five, the judgment of the kingdom have already commenced for it all centres on Jesus. Acts 17, 31. And here I've got the whole of the book of Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation, it's about the risen Lord Jesus. It's he is the lamb who now opens the seals. And as he opens the seals, the plans of God in the will of God get put into effect with the four horsemen of the apocalypse and so it goes on. Jesus is ruling the world today, not in ways that you would expect because the final judgment hasn't come that that moment of, Acts, of Revelation 20, 21, but it is heading all there because he is now King of Kings and Lord of Lords through his resurrection. And Jesus is the prophesied and predicted Christ. Whoops, what I, I've gone too slowly for you, have I? Uh, now I've gone too fast for you. The judgment of the kingdom have commenced and it all centres on Jesus. Have I gone that too fast for you to take that down? Sorry. Number six was the judgment of the kingdom commenced and all centres on Jesus and we get it on the next page as well, don't we? Isn't that clever? Oh dear. Just wonders. Jesus is the prophesied and predicted Christ and the whole argument of Acts 2 and Acts 13 that I read. Jesus is now, uh, Jesus is now the ruler of the world in Philippians 2, 9, 11, Acts 2, 36 and so on. And that means now a man, the son of man, the image of God now rules the world. And so the Bible comes to its completion in the, rev in, 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 in the resurrection. Because God created man in his image to rule the world. But you do not see man ruling the world. But you see Jesus, who for a little while was lower than the angels, now raised to rule the world, you see. And so the resurrection is man coming to the place that God has created man to be, namely ruling the world as Jesus. And all this is because there's been a satisfactory uh, sacrifice for our sins. Uh, by the way, the Romans one, I, I cannot understand why the translations, they go for four because four is a safe ambiguity, but it's because of, it's dear in the accusative on both times. Uh, he's been raised because of our justification. He's not raised for our justification, looking forward to it. He's raised because of our justification. Because we have been justified, he's been raised. That's because he paid the, f the penalty fully. If he hadn't risen from the dead, we'd still be in our sins. The fact that he's risen from the dead shows that the, the, the sacrifice has been satisfactory. And so raised because of our justification. And so new life commences in the resurrection of Jesus, Ephesians 2, 6, Colossians 3, and our text in the Two Ways to Live booklet. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's one verse on the resurrection. It captures up as many ideas as we can in the resurrection. And so what do we say in two ways to live? God raised Jesus to life again as the ruler of the world. Jesus has conquered death, now gives new life and will return to judge. All those things are true. The tense of them shows the present, the past, the present and the future that's all caught up in the resurrection. It's very hard to get a page that's going to say all the things that the New Testament says about the resurrection. Because it says there's more about the resurrection than there is about the cross in the New Testament. The resurrection is the main central message of the gospel. And so how to say which things and how to say things that make sense to the non-Christian who doesn't believe in Moses and the prophets so as to explain the meaning of it, we find most, non, most of our Christians find it difficult. 
We've removed the word therefore, which used to be there in two ways to live. And I'm arguing with the publishers that we need to put it back in again. It was removed because Christians could not understand it. Christians objected to the idea that because of the death of Jesus, therefore God raised Jesus to be. They, they just, they, they don't like it. But I'm afraid it's there in the text of the New Testament. And so I, I'm very keen to get back in.